Okay, thank you. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Welcome to another program where we will study the Word of God. Sometimes the enemy tries every means to counteract, but God is good. And for the fact that we are alive and well is more than enough to give him thanks for. So allow me to get my presentation up because I have to restart everything. Okay. Okay. All right, so I love me to share with you. Okay, so we have been studying the subject um redeeming, redeeming the time. And we have been looking at a lot of things. But bow your heads with me. Without further delay, bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We are so grateful for another evening. Lord, even as we open up your words, open up our dark understanding. And teach us, O oh God, from your words. We tell you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who were on for the last Last time we met, we, we we would have looked at the nature, understanding the nature of time. So I will just do a quick five to ten minutes review. So we, we look at understanding the nature of time. And we said um, one of the things when it comes, when, when we talk about time, is that with time, there, there is a limit. As inspiration tells us, that um, there is a limit beyond which men may no longer may not go on um, in sin. So we look at the fact that there is a limit. We also look at the fact testimony volume nine. There is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. Prophets and kings. There is a limit beyond which the judgment of Jehovah can no longer be delayed. We look at many scriptures the last time. We look at Jeremiah chapter 5, where we look in nature that there is a limit, where we see that God, the Bible says that God set the sun as a boundary um, for the sea, so the sea come this far, no further. And as it is in nature, we look at the fact that the same thing happened with the nations, that the nations, God has placed a limit on it. We look at that Daniel. Um, we, we look at the, 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 the kings, the kingdoms that rise and fall. Babylon, neither Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. We we look at the fact that Daniel told um the king Nebuchadnezzar that God set you up, you will reign for this time, another kingdom will come and deceive. See the same thing happened with Bel Belshazzar. We see the same thing happen uh, with the kingdom of Greece. We look at the feast of Daniel 5 with Belshazzar. When Daniel gave the interpretation that God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. And we look at Job chapter 14 verse 5 that tells us um, what determined means when we look at Acts 17. That with the nations, God determined the time before appointed, the Bible says, in Acts chapter 17, 25 and 26. 
that God would have determined. And Job chapter 14, 5 tells us that to determine means to number. So he numbered it. And Daniel chapter 5 would have even brought that out clearer, where Daniel said, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So in a nutshell, I just recap some of the high points we looked at the last time we met. And we said that with this plan of redemption, there is a limit, and the limit is 7,000 years. And according to Revelation chapter 20, 1,000 years will be spent in heaven by the saints. So it left us with 6,000 years on earth. So God has 6,000 years in which to finish this work. What work? The work of dealing with sin. To bring back man back to perfection. That's the great work that should be done for you and I to look just like Jesus Christ. And he will achieve it. Or he tell us he will cut this work short in righteousness. And uh, Bible principle, when we go back to creation, we see the, the, the Bible principle that God would have used six days to work in creating the earth and all the things in it. Now, God could have done that in, in a flash, in the split of a second. He could have allowed everything to be, um, up, to be created, everything to appear. He could have done that. But he went day by day by day, the first day straight up to the seventh day. The Bible says on the seventh day, God ended his work. I want us to make that sink in. On the seventh day, he ended his work. The work is done. It is finished. There is no work go on on the seventh day. He ended his work. He rests. The Bible, the Apostle Peter says, that a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. I think it's First Peter 3, if my memory serves me right. And a thousand years is like a day. So that six, that seven day week of creation, um, God in principle gave us 7,000 years for the plan of redemption. He gave us that time. And, um, and indeed, he is going to finish the work in righteousness. He's going to cut it short. And um, whether you and I are ready he is going to. Good. So it's not so so it's 2 Peter 3, not 1 Peter. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. So we should not be ignorant. It, it, it is a reason why Peter spoke so strongly here. Be not ignorant of this one thing. What is that one thing Peter is highlighting here? That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So that six days of creation. So, so I'm showing you the principle from the Bible. That six days of creation represent the, that God would have work to create this earth is a representation of the 6,000 years that he is working to bring back man in harmony with him. Follow me. The one day 
the seventh day that he ended his work and he rested is the same way the, that 1,000 years that in, in, in the 7,000 years he ended his work. What work? The work of bringing back man to perfection. And this earth is going to rest for that 1,000 years. The saints will be in heaven. And they will judge um, the people and angels as well. Those who are lost, they will judge. And also the angels who are lost as well, they will judge. So now you see the principle of the 7,000 years. So this is no fairy tale. This is biblical principle. And that is why God used that seven um, as a principle with so in Genesis, that's the beginning, as the Alpha, he gave us the 7,000 7, years principle. And as the Omega, in the end, he gave us another 7 years principle, speaking of the 7 churches. And we are the last. And that is why we, we believe, we taught, we teach these things as a church. That seven means completion. It is God's perfect number. So the question is, is this 7,000 years um, a conspiracy? Is it, uh, is it um, conspiratorial? Is this 7,000 years a conspiracy? Has um, inspiration shed any light on it? In fact, we, we would have gone through this. It says, no man know the day nor the hour was the argument. So we would have looked at that. And we said that we will not know definite time. Because we are told in great controversy that we are instructed and required to know when it is near and to disregard the warnings and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was coming, not to know definite time, but to know a time period in which they were living in. All right. So, so we looked at that. And we look at um, that whole, whole Bible text in Matthew 24, 36. And also in Mark. Where um, we say that person take that quotation out of, out of context. Um, when the Bible says, no man know the day nor the hour. I would have gone through it. I will not um, go back through it again. But I have gone through it that according to what James White in his book, um, Second Advent of Christ, um, it tells us that Christ will know the period of the second advent of his of to, to this world. The holy angels wait around the throne of heaven to receive, in, to receive messages related to the part that they play. They will know. And it is at that time we, the waiting saints, or the waiting people, will understand. So we have looked at that in detail. And we say that the correct interpretation of, of um, or, or the correct translation, rather, from an old English version, it reads, but that day and hour, no man make it known. So the sun will not make it known. Angels will not make it known. Man will not make it known. But the father will make it known. He will announce that day and hour, we are told. So that is the correct translation of the verse that reads in our Bible now that says, No man know it the day nor the hour, nor angel, nor the son, but the father only. No, this is the correct reading. No man make it 
known. All right, so um, that was the high point. So, so the day and hour of Christ come, come, come in. So we are going to see that even when it gets closer to Christ's return, God will announce the day and the hour even to the waiting saints because God has a principle that govern nature. Amos 3, 7, God does nothing but he reveal his secret to his servant, the prophet. So according to Matthew 24, and we just look at the correct um, reading of that text, this was what um, inspiration says. The voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and the hour of Jesus coming and delivering everlasting covenant to his people. Like peals of loudest thunder, his words roll through the earth. He spoke one sentence and then paused. While the words were rolling through the earth, the Israel of God stood with their eyes fixed upward, listening to the word as they came from the mouth of Jehovah, that's God the Father, and rolled through the earth like peals of loudest thunder. It was awfully solemn. At the end of every sentence, the saints shouted, Glory, Hallelujah. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake so shortly before jesus ascend sorry descend from heaven god the father will announce the very day and hour when jesus is going to deliver his people. So we will not know the definite time now, but what we will know is an approximate time, a time period, not definite time. But as it gets closer, we will know the definite time. How we will know? Because the Father will announce it. And we will hear it for those who are a part of the 144,000. So does the spirit of prophecy throw any light on this, on the subject? Let's see. So this is a biography of Sister White. The vision at Lovett's Grove, Ohio. On a Sunday afternoon in mid-March 1858 was one of great importance. In this, the theme of the great controversy between Christ and his angels on, once on the one side and Satan and his angel on the other was seen as one continuous and closely linked chain of events spanning 6,000 years. So this great controversy, God on one side and his angels, the devil on one side and his angels, it spanned 6,000 years. That is clear. This vision has put Seventh-day Adventists into a unique position with clear-cut views. So there is no doubt about it. But to today we have ministers in our circles who do not believe this. But the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 20, Believe the prophet and so shall he prosper.
So it put us in a clear, with a clear cut view of the working of providence in the history of our world. A viewpoint quite different from that held by secular historian who see events of, histor of history as the interplay between the action of men, often seeming the result of chance or natural development. In other words, this vision and others of the great conflict of the ages yield a philosophy of hist history that answers many questions in the prophetic forecast, gives the assurance of final victory of good over evil. So it is clear to us that this controversy that started in heaven, it has a span of 6,000 years. Look at this one. The great plan of redemption result in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. So the great plan of redemption result. So this is the result in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin, Genesis 3.15 is restored. So Eden lost now become Eden restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedience. Sorry, the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. So here again, she is giving us the detail when everything would have come to an end. All that was lost by sin is restored. So this is at the end. And how long did that take this Eden loss would have taken to restore? For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of this earth. Now God's original purpose in his creation is accomplished. The saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That is Daniel chapter um, 7, um, verse 12, 13, down there. It tells us that the saints will possess it. So this was from Adventist home. 539. So where are we now in the stream of time? Let's see from the book Confrontation. Pay keen attention to this one. Christ in the wilderness of temptation. Mark that date, AD 27. That's the year. Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf. Pay keen attention to this now. 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. So this is telling us that from the inception of sin, we don't have a date in the past, but from Adam turned his back upon the light of his eternal home when he sinned from that time until Christ was in the wilderness of temptation was 4,000 years. So we do not need a starting date. All we need to know from the inception of sin down to when Christ in the wilderness of temptation, 4,000 years would have 
gone out of the 6,000 years. Follow me. Separated from the presence of God, the human family has been departed each successive generation further from the original purity, wisdom, and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. Christ bore the sins and the infirmities of the race as they existed when he came to the earth to help man. In behalf of the race, with the weakness of fallen man upon him, he was to stand the temptations of Satan upon all points on which man could be assailed. So this confirmed that the nature that Christ took on was with the weakness of fallen man. That was the nature. All right. Because we have teachings in our circle that God Jesus did not come within the fallen nature of man. That teaching is in our circle. And we should know what we believe. Same book, page 78, paragraph 2. On Jordan Banks. What year was that? Same AD 27. On Jordan Banks. The voice from heaven attended by the manifestation from the excellent glory proclaimed Christ to be the son of the eternal. Satan was to personally encounter the head of the kingdom which he came to overthrow. If he failed, speaking of Lucifer, if he failed, he knew that he was lost. Therefore, the power of his temptation was in accordance with the greatness of the object which he was, which he would lose or gain. I want you to pay keen attention to this part. For 4,000 years, Ever since the declaration was made to Adam that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, he had been planning his manner of attack. What is this paragraph? Are, 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 are these lines in red saying to us? It is saying to us from the declaration was made to Adam, Genesis 3.15, down to the time when Christ was standing on Jordan's banks. It was 4,000 years. So 4,000 years would have elapsed. And we can't debate it, can't go around it, because the word of inspiration said it. So, let's see how much of that time we can know. I never get to update um, this chart. So, bear with me. Um, because we are now, Christ, is, is, it, it is now 180 years since Christ would have been in the most holy place. So, I never get to a chance to update this chart. So bear with me. So the time of redemption. So we're speaking about 6,000 years for God to finish this sin problem on earth because 1,000 years, heaven, the earth is resting during that time. So Genesis 3.15 marks the fall of man. From the fall of man down to Christ's Baptism, which was AD 27, 4,000 years was elapsed, about 4,000 years. We just read it. I want you to follow me. Christ started his holy place ministry, AD 31. 
from, from AD 27 right down to 1844 when Christ entered the most holy place. It is 1,817 years. That's so that 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 is from AD 27. But we know that it is 1813 years Christ spent in the holy place. That that would be from AD 31, 1844, 1813 years. But that time span there, I'm 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 just checking from AD 27 straight down to 1844, so we don't miss out any. 1817 years. I want you to follow me. Remember, we are told in great controversy that we are required and instructed to know when the coming of Christ is near. Not to know definite time. To give a specific month and a specific year and a specific day of the month. We will never know definite time at this moment. Not until God announces it. But for now, we can know when it is near. Approximate time. All right. So, from 1844 down to the present time. So this is where I never update the chart. Um, since, since October 22nd of, of this year, it would be 180 years. But on this chart, I would have had 179 plus due to when I did it. I never updated. it. But, but um, today, we can say it is 180 years. Since Christ is in the most holy place. Follow me. 4,000 years from Genesis 3 down to Christ's baptism. Plus another 1,817 years from AD 27 down to 1844. Um... So one, one more year will be added to that. And that would give us 5,997 years if we add the next year to it, since it is now 180. All right. So what we see today we cannot tell, give a definite time. Why? Because you know that man um, will not know um, accounting for all the integrity um, time. Why? Because the Jews reckoning of time is a little bit different from how we reckon time today. So this is not giving you specific time. This is just giving you an approximate time. Why? Because we are instructed, we are required to know when it is near, not to know definite time. So no one can leave here tonight to say, for the alarm and set some dates. No, there is no date setting. Christ did not give us that message of time setting. No. Is anything wrong with setting time? No. Because Christ, God, is a time setter. So what, what is wrong? Where, is the, where does the problem lie? The problem lies in who sets the time. So nothing wrong with setting of time. The problem lies in who sets the time. So question, what if God sets the time and reveal it to us? Then we will know. And remember, we are told that just before Christ's return, God the Father 
will announce the very date, day and hour when Christ will return. So the time will come when we will know the definite time shortly before he comes. But until then, we don't know definite time. What we should know, the closeness of the time. That is important. So we can have an idea. So what is this figure telling us here on the screen? This figure is telling us that we are very, very close to the 6,000 years. And remember, it's 7,000 years, 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven. So now we, we should understand tonight. We should live tonight with a different mindset. What mindset? Time is running out. And some of us, we, we have our resources. We, we hide it away. We stack it up in the bank. We stack it up dear and dear. And we are allowing the work of God to be suffering. But the time is coming when God will no longer want your money for the work. Now is the time for us to empty the bank and pump it into the world. You know, Nicodemus, the Bible says he came to Jesus by night. And Nicodemus, he was a part of the Sanhedrin Council. Nicodemus was the one who always looking out for Christ, even when they want to try him. In, in fact, when, when, even when they want to kill Christ before he was tried, Nicodemus was the one who stood up in that council, that Sahijin council, and asked the question, does our law condemn a man before he is tried? And that is why they could not have condemned him and killed him before he was tried. And Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus by night, and he met that man, Christ Jesus. Nicodemus was no longer the same. Inspiration says that after Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, Nicodemus would have put all his life earnings in the gospel. And he died a par pauper. Why? Because he saw the need of putting every dime in the work. So he may die as a pauper in the sight of man, but he died one of the richest. Why? Because he would have laid up his treasure in heaven. We are moth cannot corrupt it and rust cannot corrupt it god is looking for some nicodemuses today who will take their resources and finish the work here was a man called noah when god called him and said build me an ark you, you think God did rain some money from heaven and said, here Noah, go and build the ark? No. Inspiration says Noah put all his, his life earnings in it. He invested in that ark. We have another ark to be built. And Christ cannot return until that ark is completed. What are you doing with God's resources? Are you hoarding it in the banks? What are you doing with it? Are you suffering the work of God? Holding on to his resources? 
Let us think on these things. Now is not the time for us to store up money in the bank. Look at the timeline. We just have a few short months to a few short years left for this work to be finished. For this world to come to an end. For all these earthly riches and possession that we are hoarding and putting it above the work of God. It's not long from now, all of that will go up in flames. What are you doing about it? It's time for us to invest in the work. The work is suffering. When I said the work is suffering, the work is suffering. And God is looking for your helping hands. What are you doing about it? People are sick and dying out there. When I said sick and dying, people are sick, people are dying out there. What are you doing about it? And everywhere we go, brothers and sisters, everywhere we go, the problem is the same. People holding on to God resources. Because the money is not yours, you know, brethren. The Bible says everything is the Lord's. He entrusted it to us to be steward of it. Am I being a good steward of the wealth, the possession, what God has entrusted to me? Are you being a good steward? Let's think about it, brothers and sisters. Noah made great sacrifices and put all his life earnings in that work to build the ark. We need the ark of sanitariums. We need the ark of treatment rooms so that we can take in the sick and get an opportunity to bring the message of salvation to men and women that are going down in a Christless grave. And everywhere we go, the problem is the same. I am here in Jamaica, and we are struggling here in Jamaica to finish a treatment room. And everywhere you go, people not investing in the work of God. They are putting it elsewhere. They are putting it where moth and rust will corrupt it. They are not investing it where thieves cannot break in. Today, many are having identi identity theft, break into their account, remove you with some of money. Why the work of God is suffering. They, they suffer the loss. They, they suffer loss from the thief and from inflation, all these things. Where are we putting or making our investment? Look at the timeline. It is short. So 2024. And I and if you notice this five hundred this five thousand nine hundred and ninety-six, notice what I put before it, plus or minus. What does that mean? Plus means that it could be more. Minus means it could be less. Why? Because um, the reckoning, the Jews' reckoning of time and the reckoning of time today, not identical. So it could be a little bit more or it could be a little bit less. But what this is telling us we are not interested of definite time here. What we are interested in is that narrow window 
that we have to work. That narrow window, brothers and sisters, that we have to get Christ's character in us because the great work that is to be done and the little time to do it is for you and I to look just like Jesus Christ. Early writings, page 64. Time is almost, not page 75, time is almost finished. Are, are you reflecting the lovely character of Jesus as you should? This is the question to us, to me, to you. Am I reflecting the character of Jesus Christ as I should? Brethren, time is almost finished. For the next few minutes, let us look at this now from a different perspective. So I'm showing you that every angle you take it, when you look at it in the light of the sanctuary, the outer court, the holy place, the most holy place. Where is Christ? Most holy place. Is there another compartment for him to go? No. Now you look at it from the 6,000 years time frame for the plan of redemption, for the sin problem to be dealt with, you see that we are almost at the end of the 6,000 years. Brethren, this is no fairy tale. How do I know? I am reminding you of this just in case you were not here when I read it earlier on, let me read it to you again. Great Controversy, page 371. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. We are required. It is an instruction from heaven. We must know when it is near. Further, we are further taught that to disregard his warning and to refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal to us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah. Not to know when the flood was coming. So we are not to know today definite time. What we need to know, we need to know when it is near. That is what we need to know, when it is near. 2024. Plus or minus. We just have a short plus or minus three years to go. What does plus mean? It could be more. What does minus mean? It could be less. Is that definite time? No. What is that? Approximation of time. Knowing when it is near. Near what? Near the 6,000 years that God has given this earth. This is no fairy tale, brothers and sisters. It's no fairy tale. It's right upon us. So another plus or minus three years. We are looking at a range of 2027 plus R minus. So what does the plus mean? It could be more. What does the minus mean? It could be less. That is why I said to you that 2024, before this year end, it's no, it will be no ordinary year. And 2025, Project 2025, the year 2025 will be no normal year. 
I can tell you that great changes are already taking place in this world right around us. And we, the devil, has given Seventh-day Adventists a sleeping pill. Ten virgins, all ten of them were asleep. The church is asleep. God wants us to be awakened to the reality of what is happening. Do not take that election in your country for those who are living in the United States. Do not take that election lightly. I said before this year ends, we are going to see serious things happening. 2025 will be no ordinary year. Brother, brothers and sisters, brethren, saints of God, let us take heed and occupy the few golden moments that God has given us to use all our means to finish the work. If we were faithful to the trust and if we truly believe, you see, we preach it, but we don't believe it. We go out there and we tell them Jesus is coming soon. But at the same time, we are saying soon far in the distance because our lifestyle is not indicating that Christ is at the door. No. No. Let me show you here something. This, 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 bring this to me now. Go to the book of James, chapter 5. Let me show you something from the book of James. James, chapter 5, is a prophetic book. It's an end-time book. James, chapter 5. Go to James, chapter 5. Because what we are seeing, we are seeing the very things that are now happening. James, chapter 5. Can, I want someone to please read that for us. Read verse 1 to 4 for us first. Someone read that. 1 to 4. Who has that one? James chapter 5. 1 to 4. You can unmute and read. James chapter 5. Who has that one? I'll read. Go ahead. James chapter 5, 1 to 4. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is conquered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. He has heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cry it. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Sabbath. Amen. He have, he have All right. lived... Go ahead. He have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. He have nourished your heart as in the day of slaughter. Read verse 6 and 7 now. He have condemned and killed the just and he does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and had long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Amen. Thank you, my sister. So, James is saying that when you see the wickedness, how those who are called the elites, well, how they, when they bring oppression on the people, how they take away the, the poor, the little that the poor man has, when, when the cost of living and everything get more and more intense 
James is saying that when you see these things, be patient. Why? Because the husbandman waited for the precious fruits of the earth and hath what? Hath long patient for it until he receive what? The early and latter rain. Then look at verse 8 and 9. Be he also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord joyeth nigh. So when you see these things, the coming of the Lord joyeth what? Nigh. Look at verse 9. Grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. So what will bring the judge to the door? All these wickedness that is going on in the land. The judge, the husband man, is ready and waiting. The judge is standing at the door. And did Jesus say this in Matthew 24? Yes, when he said, learn the parable of the fig tree. When it put out its tender branch, you know that what? That summer is nigh. It's the same way Jesus said, when you shall what? See these things. Know that he is at the, at the door. Brothers and sisters, it is here. If we believe this, our lifestyle would show it. We would take our resources and pump it into the gospel for the work to be finished. But guess what? Inspiration tells us that many of us, we are waiting until the Sunday law is passed and all of these things before we take our money and put in. But at that time, it's going to be too late. It's not needed again. Now is the time the resources are needed. We need sanitariums. We need treatment rooms. We need health facilities. The, the, the hospitals are overload, overpacked. People are dying like flies every day. You know, since week, um, I'm, I'm a church brother of mine who is my barber. I was there getting my hair cut. And he was saying that um, uh, um, two doctors were there earlier on because they they came to cut their hair. And they were reasoning with one, one another. And they were saying that people are dying every day in the hospital here. Every day, people are dying like flies. And God gave us the solution. It is not the dying that they are dying, but it is the Christless grave that many are going down into. What are you doing about it? And you see if we hoard our resources and make the work of God suffer, you and I, are those who do that will never hold a place in the kingdom of God. Because God sees us as a murderer as well. Because our resources could have saved a life. But we rather hoard it and keep it and make souls perished forever. We are talking about eternally lost. Brethren, let us repent and let us take up this work. Let us support this work so that many can come to the knowledge of truth. Let's look at it from a next perspective. The, the, we are going to look at it now from the generation perspective. And I'm going to show you from your Bible, from my Bible, that we are definitely in the last generation. So I'm, I'm going to show you that every angle you take it, brothers and sisters, 
it is the same thing. When I said it is the same thing, it is the same thing. Let me go over to Second Kings. So we're going to look at it from the generation perspective. Second Kings 10. All right. Just want to be certain. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So the generation perspective. I'm going to show you that, in fact, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, you know this well. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. The fourth generation always take God to the limits. And I'm going to show you from the Bible perspective. I'm going to show you from the spirit of prophecy that the principle is in the Bible. Before we look at that, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Someone read for us Genesis chapter 15. So we're going to show you that this is the last generation. We are in the fine, the fourth generation of Seventh-day Adventists. So remember, Seventh-day Adventists, the first generation starts 1844. We're going to look at that in detail and show you that this is the limit generation. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 14. In fact, verse 13 to, to 16. Can some, some, someone read that for us? Genesis chapter 15, 13 to 16. Who has that one? Can unmute and read. I pray for participation. Genesis 16. Genesis 15. Which verse? 16. Genesis 15, 13 to 16. Yes. Okay. It says, and he said unto Arab, know of the surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Amen. Thank you. So here God gave Abraham a promise. That... Yes, your seed, they are going to go in a strange land, but they are going to come out with great sub, sub, substance. You, Abraham, you're going to live to see a good old age, but your seed will not come back to the throne until the fourth generation. Why? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not Yet full, God could not drive them out because God always give a limit. And the limit is the fourth generation. So let's see. The same principle for bad is the same principle for good. Go over to 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 30. I'm going to show you that the principle is one common denominator throughout the Bible. I'm going to look at the same principle. Second Kings chapter 10 and verse 30. I will read that one. And the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and has done unto the house of Ahab, according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the 
fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So God said, you children of what? The fourth generation. Let's see if that did happen. Let us go over um, to chapter 15 and verse 12. And I will read chapter 15 and verse 12. This was the word of the Lord which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy sons shall sit on thy throne of Israel unto the fourth generation, and it came to pass. It was not until the fourth generation. That's the limit. And according to the Bible, um, Numbers 32, let me show you from your Bible, because you must see it from the Bible as we get ready to wrap up um you must see it from your bible genesis chapter sorry numbers chapter 32 and verse 13 genesis exodus leviticus and numbers the numbers chapter 32 and verse 13 listen to what the bible says in verse 13 of numbers 32 and the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. So according to the Bible principle, it is forty years that comprise a generation. Is there another proof of scripture? Brother Larman, let us go over to Joshua chapter 5 and verse 6. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then Joshua. So Joshua chapter 5, hope I got it right. Chapter 5 and verse 6. Yes, got it right. This is what Joshua 5 and verse 6 says. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto the fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. So 40 years constitute. Let's see if we can find another um, text. I think it's in Psalm. Psalm. Psalm 90 something. Psalm 95. Let me see. Psalm. Psalm 95, yes, and verse 10. Psalms 95 and verse 10. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So 40 years was I grieved with this generation. And remember, we just read um, earlier on in Numbers 32, 13, that all of them were men of war. They were consumed. So that entire generation, 40 years, Bible principle, constitute a generation. Let me show you a few slides now. Before I close so you can see what I am getting at because I want you to see it from the Bible first because you, you should always open up the word the word of God the Bible it is this the answer is right in it of the Amorites the Lord said in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption 
it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity, and God could not give command for its utter destruction. So you see, God suffers long, so he bears long. The cup has to be full. Look at this, Testimony Volume 5. The people were to see the divine power manifest in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing. I want, I want you to zoom in on this, brethren. We say we believe the prophet. Let's, let, let's read. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with the iniquity until the what? Until the fourth generation. Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgment were to fall upon them. The limit is always the fourth generation. He bears long. But if after the fourth generation, if no change is made or seen for the better, then his judgment will fall on us. So let's see now. While God bears long with the transgressors, there is a limit beyond which men may not go on in sin. When that limit is reached, then the offers of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment begins. Last day's events, God keeps a record with the nations. The figures are swelling against them in the books of heaven. And when it shall have been become a law. I want you to see what will take us to the limit in our brethren. When it shall become a law. That the transgression of the first day of the week. Shall be met with punishment. Then their cup will be Filled, will sorry will be full that's the limit inspiration says when america passed that national sunday law she says in heaven it is written national apostasy the limit is reached and then we will start to see god's divine judgment start to fall upon the nations we don't see anything yet brethren and Brothers and sisters, I want you to look at this chart. Generation, first generation of Seventh-day Adventism, 1844 to 1884. Remember, 40 years, according to Bible, constitute a generation. The second generation, 1884 to 1924. So we see that the first generation, the first generation must come to a, came to an end in eighteen eighty four. But guess what? Now the second generation did not come on the scene because remember it is not until age twenty before the men of Israel enrolled into the army. You can read that in Numbers chapter 1. It is laded in Numbers chapter 1 that it is always age 20. The men engage in the war. Let me just read two verses for you. Numbers chapter 1. From 20 years old and upwards, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron, shall number them by their armies. When we go down to verse 18, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they declared their pedigrees after their families by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names from 20 years and upwards by their pole. Let me read one more. Verse 24. Of the children of God, 
by their generation after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of their names, from 20 years old and upwards, all that were able to go forth to war. So the men of Israel never get engaged in the war until age 20. Are we in a warfare? Yes. So in, in 1844, one would not get engaged in the war until age 20. So basically, when you add 20 years to 1844, that's how it take you to 1904. I want you to follow me. That's when the second generation would have came on the scene. And then from 1844 up to 1924, that will span the second generation limit. But remember, the male, they do not get into the war until age 20. What does that mean? How does that apply to us today? It simply means that at that age, if that's the time when they engage in the spiritual war, when you have what? These young men grew up in the church. They go off to college. They now become the pastors and elders and the movers and shakers of the church. That is what it means. Linking the type with the anti-type because we are in a war. The Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. We are in a war. Follow me. From 1924 to 1964, using the 40 years principle, the third generation, that's the third generation time period. But remember, when does the third generation really take over? So though they come on the scene, when do they take over? Not until what? Age 20, they enlisted in the war. So let's see. So when we add 20 years to 1924, it takes us to 1944. It was that time the third generation of Seventh-day Adventists would have taken over the church, become movers and shakers. They become pastors and elders. And when their time come to an end, 1964. Then we go into a different era, a different generation. So from 1964, we add 40 years. It takes you to what? 2004. But remember, it's at age 20 before we get engaged in the war. Using the principle. is the principle we're using. So if we add 20 years to when the fourth generation came on the scene, 20 years would take us to 1984. That's the time they really take over. They become movers and shakers of the church. So when will the fifth generation came on the scene? 2004 to 2044. But remember, according to the Bible, he visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Let me show you another principle as the Spirit brought it to, to, to my attention. Go to the book of Amos. Let, let, let me show you something from the book of so Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos. Let me show you something from the book of Hosea, Joel, Amos. Look at the principle. Let me show you that God, this is Bible. He has a principle. Amos chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgression of Damascus and for, for four, I will not turn away the punishment. Therefore, because 
they have threshed Gilead with threshing instrument of iron. Go down to verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgression of Gaza, and for four I will not turn away the punished men thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity of to deliver them up to Edom. Look at verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgression of Tyrus, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom and remembered not the brotherly covenant. And you could read verse 11, verse 13. It gives you that principle that four, God said, once it reached four, I will not turn it away. I will execute judgment because four takes God to the limit. Unto the third and fourth generation. And we all see this all over the Bible. So let's look at the fifth generation. So the fifth generation would have come on the scene since 2004, mean that they born into the church, they become a babe, they grew up into the church. And guess what now? It was not until age 20 they get engaged in the war. That is when they become movers. They go out to become pastors and elders and become movers and shakers of the church. So when will the fifth generation become movers and shakers of the church? Let's see. 20 years principle. 2024. Now God cannot allow the fifth generation to run the church. What would they pass on? What would they teach? What would they preach? So you see how everything is pointing to 2024, 2025? We look at the 6,000 years plan of redemption. Now you see how everything coming together. The picture is coming together. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to show you that the same thing with the nations. The, 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 the nation has a 250 year cycle and the America 250 year cycle soon come to an end in 2026. Every angle you take it, things are shutting in pointing to the same period. And remember, inspiration tells us that the fourth generation is the limit. I bring back the quotation because right now, we were living of the blessings of the first generation. But the heart of our message today has become corrupted. The heart Stop beat. It becomes dead. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with the iniquity until the fourth generation. Then if no change was seen for the better. I wonder if changes have been made in our churches. Yes. But the changes that would have been made, is it for the better? No. Why? Because now we see women ordination. We see homosexual pastors. We see um, that they do not believe the message anymore. We see a deterioration. So a change has made, but not for the better. Then, his judgment must fall upon us. The fourth generation is the limit. 
the fifth generation will never run this church. So now you see it from the generation perspective. Show you it from the Bible. Show you from the spirit of prophecy. Everything is pointing that the 6,000 years almost come to an end. Brothers and sisters, if, and this is my personal view, if this earth lasts for the next two years, it's a miracle. If we go through 2025, in fact, if we go through 2024 without that National Sunday Law pass in America, it is a miracle from God himself just to give us a little bit more loophole. This is where we stop tonight. In fact, this brought us to the end um, of this study as well, redeeming the time. Why should we redeem the time? Because the days are evil and we should what? We should know and understand what the will of God is. We have 10 minutes. I can take any questions or if someone wants to make a point, free to make your point, free to ask a question. If not, we will pray and close off. All right, so bow your heads with me. I don't see any hands. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have allowed us to accomplish tonight. Thank you for this, these lessons, oh God. Thank you for the eye-opener for us to see that we are almost at the very end. We are on the very verge of falling over a cliff and we cannot see it. But Lord, open our eyes so that we may see. Lord, I pray for every single individual on this platform that you may continue to bless, you may continue to lead and direct. And as we look forward towards your second coming, Lord, help us to form that relationship with you so that we can have that bond so that we can unite with you in this work to finish the work. And at the end, we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Lord, this is our desire. Please, Lord, help us to become more serious about this work, to take our means and to put it in the work. It is not our means, Lord. It is yours. You entrusted it to us. But convict us. Convert us. We tell you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a happy, blessed Sabbath to you all. Sister 